been getting letters from some of you guys um, that in this holiday season, it's really stinking hard. Um, and I, I got to tell you, I've been through some holiday seasons and, and knock on some wood, you know, uh, I've got it really good right now. And I'm grateful for that. But there have been some holiday seasons where it was tough with a catch, capital T. I remember the first holiday after my son had been diagnosed. He had been diagnosed in the January of the year before. And um, it felt bleak. I wasn't working because I was I was home to help take care of him and the in intervention that um, that we had been doing for uh, the first few months, which totally didn't work before we switched to card, kind of sank our battleship because we lost a lot of time and energy, and then the school district followed due process fi filed due process against us. And I, you know, money was like I was looking for for lawyers because I hadn't found Bonnie Yates yet, and uh, it was a mess. It was a massive mess, and there was it was not only my child wasn't well, but my fa finances weren't well, my head wasn't well, and I was overwhelmed, and I didn't know what we were gonna do. And I sat down to look at the finances for the month, and there wasn't enough money to feed us for the month, have a Christmas dinner, have a toy for my child and afford his medicine. Like all of those things could not happen. And um, Taka uh, gave us a scholarship and a family adopted us and, and gave us presents for my son. And I don't know how we would have gotten through it otherwise. It's one of the reasons why we do the Sensitive Santa because I feel uh, the need and desire to give back because I know how hard it can be. And here's the thing, this is the time when, we, when we're going to talk about play and sometimes it feels like, are you kidding me? Like things are so rough right now. You want to talk about board games? Yes, uh, I do because this is a part of the reason why play is so important. It's a space in which to work out some of the hardest things that there are. Um, and if we get too far detached from fun, we are a mess right? Um, and I will tell you that Nancy, the, you know, this is going to be the hardest holiday. It's the first one without Reed. And, and it brings up all of the memories of last year because we were losing him by inches. He died on January 25th and we knew by this, Nancy and I stood there yesterday and held on to each other and, re, and we were remembering that we knew that we had only a limited time with Reed left and she was having that settle in and had the fear of what was she going to do? Uh, how was she going to talk to her son about it, right? But we had to take some time to play some board games because of the segment that we were doing yesterday with Brian Turtle. So this was two days ago that we had this conversation. And I said to her, I know it's rough, but we got to sit here and we got to play some board games so that you're up on how you play these things because I already knew how to play them. And she was, I, you know, honestly, she looked at me like, you're nuts. Like, I am not in the headspace to do this. I said, I know, just sit down, play a board game with me. And within minutes, it wasn't like all of that had gone away. But with, within minutes, we were laughing and we had a sense of humor about certain things. We hugged each other at the end of all of it. And she said, this was really good for me. It's so important that we don't get too far away from the ability to play. Because play is where you work out everything. It's, it's, <coughs> it's dreaming uh, when you're awake. We go to sleep at night and we dream so that our brain can cope with the things that happen and make sense of them, right? Um, and it shows us movies to, that are, those are our dreams to make sense of them. Well, play is the same thing. It's the way we make sense of what's going, but we're awake when we do it. It is vital. It is important. It's a place to learn how to fail. It's a place to learn how to cope. Um, and we can learn new skills. So I want to talk about a couple of different kinds of play that we will see kids engage in and why it's so important to get some of these fine-tuned. So one of the first things that we always talk about when we talk about play is functional pretend play. Yep, I know it's more jargon, but see if you can hang with me. Functional pretend play is when we give kids toys that look like a real thing, but a toy version of it, right? Almost every kid has a phone. 
when they're uh, small children. I mean, you can go and buy for a six month old a toy cell phone. And I know a lot of people get fatutzed about this and go, well, that's not right. But no, it's exactly right. Because it's a place for a child to play with a thing, they push the buttons. It's, you know, they're not connecting with China. It's not costing a whole lot of money, but it will make a noise. And what the child is learning is the cause and effect. I take my finger, I do this, and something happens. And that's an important skill that they need to learn. And at six months, that's an appropriate thing for them to make sense of. As they get older, the functional pretend play toys get a little bit more um, advanced. Uh, so, you know, there's always an aisle in the toy store, and I never liked this aisle before I understood this. Can I just tell you, I was like, that's a terrible aisle. It's the one where they have the fake food, and they have the fake dishes, and the china sets, and they have the fake vacuum cleaners, which I always was offended by, right? Um, but now I know not to be offended by that, because guess what? Unless their circumstances in their life are extraordinary, right? They're probably going to need to run a vacuum cleaner in their lives. And I'm now teaching my son how to run the vacuum cleaner and how to have it go back and forward and swivel it into whatever. Um, because I didn't give him a play vacuum cleaner when he was a child. I didn't. Um, what, I, what my child did do that was functional pretend play was that he would find anything. It could be a deck of cards. And and, there, and we have a, a Saratoga trunk, um, and he would take the, the card and he would run it along the side of the, because he was trying to run it like a credit card, <laughs> swiping it. Because uh, he knew if I do this, mom does that, and we get to take stuff home. Um, so he was doing that on our trunk. That's functional pretend play, but it's a little bit more advanced than functional pretend play. Um, so in any, and we'll talk about that in a second. But so um, super duper important that we get, especially for our kiddos who are on the autism spectrum, who may have missed some of the social things that come with, let's set the table with the fake dishes. Let's set the teacups on there and I'll pour tea for you and now you pour it for me. But you have to remember with all play, our kiddos on the spectrum, we assume that, oh, it's play, so it's going to be fun. Even though when we sit down and we go, oh, I'm going to do a tea party, not so much fun for us, right? Because why? Why is that fun for us? You know, that's the same mindset that our kids with autism come to it. It's work. It's work. <laughs> you're, just, you're just taking colored plastic and doing work. We're setting the table. It's work. So that is logical. Uh, it's little kids ha have fun with it because, oh, I'm being like mommy and daddy, um, right? But not so much our kiddos on the spectrum. Now, that doesn't mean we give up on it and go, well, we're just not going to work on those things with them because it's actually a really, really important thing to work on. But we have to pair that play with something fun or it won't be fun for them. So we have to make sure that there's real reinforcers to deal with and make this other stuff reinforcing. It might mean that we have real cookies instead of pretend cookies. It might mean that we put something that really is their favorite drink in the clean teapot, right? We have to make sure that the teapot is clean um, so that we make it reinforcing. Um, some kids find having their stuffed animals be the guests at the table reinforcing, but some kids don't. And the thing about it is, is that you have to be Sherlock Holmes and keep trying to figure out what makes it reinforcing for your kids. But you're always taking something that's not reinforcing and pairing something that is reinforcing with it at the same time. Because we know through years of study that after a while, the thing that wasn't reinforcing, if you pair something reinforcing with it over and over and over again, and then you start to fade this out. So maybe we have a bunch of jelly beans on the table and we eat the jelly beans and we have such a good time and ooh, we tickle and everything and it's all good. And then the next time we don't, we have a lot, half the jelly beans, right? So we still have jelly beans, but not as many and we're tickling and doing whatever, we're having a good time. And the next time maybe we have 10 jelly beans on the table and we're still you know, laughing and tickling and having a good time and, and doing the play tea set and then we have two jelly beans and we laugh and we tickle and have a good time. The next time we have no jelly beans but we laugh and we tickle and we have a good time and the next time we don't even tickle, we just sit down and have the... It's amazing how it works, y'all. <laughs> it's a great magic trick. It absolutely works. So 
The point is you can do this with anything and it doesn't have to be jelly beans and tickles, but take whatever is actually reinforcing to the kid, pair it with what isn't and that makes it reinforcing. Now I know you're thinking to yourself, oh, that's some work. I don't want to do that work. But what's at, what's at stake? If you don't teach play, and by the way, if you don't teach all the other kinds of play that I'm about to, to talk to you about, your child will be, in all likelihood, will get to be like 14 and have that very limited interest and only want to do one thing. And that's when you go, oh, oh, I messed up. But instead of feeling like that, because I know there are some of you who are watching who have 14 year olds, don't feel that, just go, okay, how can I do that now? How can I go and introduce something else? Because we need, I, I don't think when somebody has a perse perseverative interest that that's a bad thing. I don't think that at all. What I do think is not healthy is when we don't give them at least a couple of other choices because what happens to their anxiety level if they get shut off from that thing that is the perseveration? The anxiety goes whoop, right? And we don't want that. So you really got to have a couple of backups of things that are exciting for them um, that besides the perseverative interest. So, okay, functional pretend play. Uh, really important that we have that. Then we move from there to symbolic play. So I was saying that my son would take something and he would pretend that it was a credit card. He might take a phone or a playing card and pretend that it was a, cre a credit card. So that's symbolic play. That's when you take something that isn't the thing that you uh, wanted to play with and you pretend, you endow it with uh, things so that it becomes, so this can become a, a, a squeezy uh, thing or it can become a harmonica or it can become a hat, right? Um, and, and so we're, we're being really imaginative here, but we're taking something that exists. I can take a bar of soap and I can turn it into almost anything. It can be a boat, it can be a car. I can, I can make uh, the bar of soap a car by going beep, beep, purr. And if you have not played this way with a child, let me encourage you to do that because you see them go, hey, especially kids on the spectrum, but pretty much all kids, the first time they see somebody play this way, they go, hey, you know, that's not, and you keep doing it, and see how long it takes them to go, I want in on that, especially if I look like I'm having fun. They want in on it. And that opens their mind to possibilities of other things, that this can be more than a phone. So once we get to that, that then we get to pure imaginative play. And so many of you write in and say, my child doesn't demonstrate uh, creativity or imagination what do I need to do about that? You, the, uh, honestly, you can teach your child these things, but you must go back and teach the basics of play and you must pair it with reinforcement and make it fun. And then you open, and I'll tell you if you think, okay, well, that's great because I do want my child to be creative and I do want them to have different ways of looking at things. But here's the other thing. You know what that works on? Flexibility. We've all experienced the kid who it's like, no, it's got to be this way and it can't be any other way, right? Um, so much of that is in our children on the autism spectrum. And we can say to them, oh, we're not driving to school this way. And the child has a meltdown and we go, well, just too bad. We're going to do it anyway. And you're going to have to deal with it because we can't, you can't go your whole life and only go to school this one way, right? But how effective is that? And it's miserable and it hurts us, right? But why not work on flexibility first on something else with play? so that we take a toy that is not a car and we make it a car and we make that fun. We put other things that are reinforcing on top of it so the child learns, oh, I, this can be more than one thing. And then we do that with something else and we do it with something else and something else so that he's got like 15 examples of how fun it is when this can be something else. And then we work on uh, driving the car a different way. So just to recap, we've got functional pretend play, we've got symbolic play, then we've got um, um, imaginative play, and then we have sociodramatic play. 
This is when you take on the character of something else or somebody else. When we play house, when we put on costumes and I'm the fireman and I say to you, you're the dog, uh, whether we have a costume or not, we're doing sociodramatic play. And for our kiddos on the autism spectrum, super duper important that we give them the opportunity to do that. And for kids who don't like to wear costumes, we, we don't have to do costumes, but for kids who do like costumes, I encourage you to do that. They dress up, think about all the things that you can be learning and playing and failing successfully at when you are uh, pretending to be somebody else. First of all, you're learning perspective taking because if I'm now the dog, I don't act like me, I act like the dog, which forces me to think, how does a dog react? What is it like being the dog? How do I see things as the dog? You, they don't even realize it, you don't even realize it, all the things that they're learning. Um, but from there, you know, what does the dog say, right? Uh, kids have different conversations and they can work out different problems. You know, when kids have been abused, often a psychologist will take them into the room and they'll play with dolls because they see that the kid will begin to give the doll the feelings of what they're feeling. All of these things, play helps to reduce stress and deal with whatever you have going on. Um, it's also a place in which they learn how to cooperate with other kids. We're gonna talk about these board games and cooperation. Um, they learn about conflict resolution, um, how, how to solve problems uh, that are both social in nature, nature and not social in nature. It is amazing. Play is one of the best tools that there are. I especially love, I'm going to talk briefly just about skills. I love my little skills tent. Remember skillsforautism.com. It has an entire curriculum that is for play. And one of the things that it has set up is a series of lessons that to teach all those things that we just talked about. But then it has something called play stations. Uh, where you set up for a kiddo uh, a schedule of, okay, you know, and, and with visual timer and everything and say, okay, you know, for the next 10 minutes, you're going to play in the kitchen and, you know, you're going to do whatever. And then when the timer goes off, you're going to go from there to, uh, you know, working on arts and crafts. And from there, you're going to go to, you know, and there's all these different PlayStations that they set up. And it doesn't have, you know, it could be like a piece of paper and a marker is a PlayStation, right? Um, but you set up at least three or four of them, right? And you have timers and they have to switch between them. Guess what you're working on there? First of all, you're working on varied interests. You're working on flexibility and you're preparing the child for when they go to kindergarten and they go from center to center to center. They did this with my son who had such difficulty with transitioning uh, and they did it for the six months before he went to kindergarten and when we got to kindergarten I, I tell you what I got down on my hands and knees and thanked them because they you know the the kindergarten teacher best kindergarten teacher in the world she would ding the little bell and then it was time for them to move centers and there were other kids neurotypical kids in his class who were crying and going I didn't finish my painting I don't want to go and my son was like dun, 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 moving on to the next section and I'm having a good time um, he was totally fine with it, man. He was so level because we'd already made that reinforcing to him. And, you know, I will tell you, he loves video games and it's hard for me to pull his hands off the video games, but I'm so grateful for that work that we did because now at 13, I can say to him, okay, we're done with video games for today. We have to go and do this. And while there's a little bit of grumbling, it's not what I'm seeing from other families. Uh, so work on play work on play. It is work. It is going to take some initiative on your part, but I think you'll find that it'll get you in a good groove because when you have to work on making something fun, it ends up being fun for you too. So work on play, my friends. <laughs>